Welcome back everyone to the Student Privacy Boot Camp. My name is Amelia Vance again and I'm the Director of Student Privacy at the Future of Privacy Forum. And I and my colleague Sarah Clark will be presenting on state student privacy laws. I like to start our presentations by talking about the Siegel Risk Framework. So Jim Siegel is the technology architect for Fairfax County Public Schools. And he has created this framework to talk about what people should consider when it comes to student privacy, which I think is a really useful frame when you're talking about student privacy laws at the state or federal level. So most people, when they're thinking about student privacy, are focusing on compliance, dealing with FERPA, dealing with COPPA, dealing with state laws. But there are these two other circles that converge here. One is actual privacy and security risks, which may not align with what is allowed or not allowed under law. For example, you could have a teacher share a student's image on social media, and that would potentially be a violation of their privacy, particularly if they have uh, perhaps a domestic situation at home or something where their picture shouldn't be available freely online. That could be allowable under the law, but could still be a privacy violation. You could also have perhaps the most forgotten category of risks not thought about, which is perception. The vast majority of the laws we're about to talk about occurred not because of a violation of law or a violation of a privacy or security issue. It was because of perception. It was a lack of information that really drove so much of the state student privacy law conversation. So I'm gonna turn That's things me. over to Sarah to start. That's me, yeah. So obviously we're here today to talk about state privacy laws. Uh, just, just to set the stage, we've already heard about FERPA and we've already heard about COPPA, but FERPA is really the floor for student privacy protection in the United States. It's the basic level of, and the basic rights that every parent and student are guaranteed that where, if they're going to school in a uh, school where FERPA is applicable, obviously. Um, but but many, many states have adopted student privacy laws that are stronger or more stringent than FERPA. Um, and many of these have happened over the past five years. Uh, and there's a reason for that. So this this uh, this uh, icon was pretty pretty prominent about five years ago, and um, that that's the uh, logo for InBloom. InBloom uh, was funded, I think it was like 2011. It it started started in 2013 and was gone by 2014, and it was it was introduced as uh, is an ed tech product adopt, going to be adopted by about a dozen different states. Uh, and then it met some opposition. Um, and some is a kind of kind term uh, for that. But uh, there's a really great study that was done, um, retrospective of sorts, of what happened with InBloom. And to summarize a little bit was InBloom was launched Met, met some opposition by, from parent groups and other privacy advocate groups, uh, quickly uh, decided to, many states quickly decided to not adopt it um, and continued pushing um, in the state of New York prominently and uh, eventually in bloom shut down and the state of New York passed a student privacy law. Um, and that kicked off a number of other states and in Bloom really ramped up a lot of the advocacy work at on the state level to pass student privacy laws. And since then, we've seen dozens of brand new student privacy laws around the country in various states in various forms um, that really have were kicked off because of In Bloom. Um, and again, I recommend any any company or education person interested in education technology take a re make sure you read this retrospective because it's a really good warning of what can happen if you forget and don't properly communicate what your product actually does. Do you have anything 
don't think so. So yeah. focusing um, on what some of the primary concerns are. As I said, many of these laws and, and a lot of the fall of in bloom was really based on perception concerns, lack of understanding about what the product was, what the value was, what the privacy protections were, how uh, parents interacted with the system, what rights they had. And so at the end of the day, you have a lot of fears, you have a lot of myths, but you can boil down a lot of the concerns that came out from parents and privacy advocates down to these buckets. So first you have commercialism, concern about advertising to kids, trying to influence them into getting your product. As more and more third parties are entering the education system, whether they're uh, the student information system becoming the digitized file folder, whether they're a learning management system providing content, allowing kids to submit homework, or a math app or a reading app that can get kids more excited, more engaged in their own education, uh, there's this concern that that's a back door to really go after kids and eventually as they grow up, make their parents or make themselves spend money. Uh, and so you have a lot of concerns that boil down to a ban on advertising and a ban generally on any showing of advertisements or any use of student data that could then be used uh, for commercial purposes. Second, you have bad actors. We're going to talk in a little bit about security, but it's important to remember that in many ways, in Bloom wasn't this big thing that obviously was going to cause student privacy issues. It was the straw that broke the camel's back. In the same year that all of these laws started, you had the target breach, where pretty much everybody knew someone with a credit card that was now vulnerable. You had uh, people uh, still talking about Edward Snowden and his revelations that the government had been spying on all of us for years. So you had this big distrust in government. You had various other breaches that were coming up more and more. And all of this conversation boiled over to the education space, really leading to all of this. And part of that was bad actors. Part of that was somebody's going to come after the information and do bad things with it. Now, inevitably, a lot of the examples that were brought up weren't really about bad actors per se. They weren't about potential stalkers or pedophiles or uh, people that could get information and do identity theft. It was really about, again, commercialization where bad actors going to take your kid's information and use it to advertise to them. But more and more over the past few years, as we've had even more breaches, uh, this has moved to a focus on hackers. Are people going to access information about my child for identity theft or just to disclose it maliciously to others? And we'll talk more about that later. So another concern that wasn't talked about as much, but still absolutely influenced the conversation, was putting students on tracks. So we're very often in education talking about the value of personalized learning and the ability that technology offers to really allow teachers to work one-on-one -on -one with students to really figure out how to provide a personalized experience for every student. However, this also means that because each student is getting a personalized experience, they may not be getting the same experience as everyone else. And because of things like historical data that disadvantages African Americans, students with disabilities, women in certain professions, uh, the data would say that you, a girl, would not make a good doctor because most women don't become doctors and therefore you as a little girl might be steered away from trying to become a doctor and taking the courses that you need in high school and in college in order to become that profession. And so there's a concern that the collection of this data and sharing of this data with third parties will lead to reducing students' opportunities, whether those opportunities are scholarship programs, getting into college, or getting a career down the road. And then finally, for the last category, general unknowns. Yeah, that's mine. <laughs> just, uh, just general unknowns as all of these new innovations are coming out and 
whether teachers are bringing them into the classroom without the permission of their school district or without the knowledge of parents or just general new newfangled technologies that haven't really been fully fleshed out. We haven't really figured out what, what they are and what they mean. I, I think there's a little bit of, of cautionary, uh, people want to be more cautious as they're adopting those new technologies because they don't know what they're going to do or what they're capable of. So, so while they are very cool, making sure that there are some there, there are some fair um, criticisms being leveraged of being um, weighed against them, making sure that those are considered as and um, thought about as new technologies are brought into the classroom or used in the school district. Absolutely. And related to that research about the efficacy of ed tech products versus what we've always done, questions about parents, the vast majority of whom didn't have tech in their classroom. Why does my kid need something different? I learned just fine. I'm doing just fine. Being able to answer those types of questions and address these concerns as an ed tech company is very important because we've had a massive, massive shift in the legal landscape since 2013. So we are now up to 39 states passing 121 student privacy laws, specifically student privacy laws since 2013. If you count the laws that just mention student privacy, you can add about another 40 or 50 laws. We've had well over 700 bills introduced in all 50 states on student privacy. This issue has filled every state capital and the halls of Congress with, I think the maximum number was eight federal bills on student privacy all active at one time. So the concerns that we just talked about were heard and they were put into these various laws. So what are these laws? Um, in case anyone wants a list of the laws passed since 2013, they are posted on our website at ferpasherpa.org slash state dash laws. So there are two types of laws. The first is really based on FERPA. So it built off the, the idea that schools are ultimately responsible for student privacy. And therefore, schools should be able to answer parent questions. So there were requirements for transparency in many of the bills. There were requirements that districts put someone in charge of student privacy to at least find out the answer to questions, even if they didn't have them. There were data governance requirements, so requiring that there be a policy on privacy, uh, requiring data inventories. What data are you collecting? And why are you collecting it? Is there a legal basis that requires the collection of that information? And several of those laws uh, were passed, I would say, in about 30 states. However, these laws did lead to unintended consequences. As I said, a lot of the student privacy conversation was really focused on fear was responding to these perception concerns about a lack of transparency, about a world where tech companies were trying to sell things to your children and schools, uh, it was the wild west for schools where they had no control and there were no laws containing the spread. And so some states went a bit overboard. The most dramatic example being Louisiana. Louisiana passed a law in 2014 that required essentially an opt-in from parents before any information could be shared. It required that the state education agency not get any personally identifiable information, making it very difficult for them to do reporting. It required that there be uh, various controls in districts. It required a level of security. But perhaps worst of all, it was vague. <laughs> People didn't understand what they were required to do. And so schools asked whether they were allowed to announce football player names, whether they were allowed to hang student artwork in the hallways. It accidentally banned school photography in yearbooks because you 
better believe some parents did not sign those forms and then came to school asking why their kid's picture was not taken. And the very interesting thing about the law was the penalty. If you made a mistake, you could go to jail. An individual, a teacher, could go to jail. And so everybody was terrified about violating this law. And it's pretty easy to dismiss things like football player names and artwork in hallways and yearbooks. Like at the end of the day, it's not fun, but does that, is that really a big deal? It was a big deal to some people. There were a few kids who, despite teachers visiting homes, despite administrators calling, despite constantly reaching out to parents, there were a few students who were not referred to the state scholarship fund that year. And so privacy laws that go too far can, in fact, harm students. The following year, the Louisiana legislature rolled back to the law to some extent. They allowed districts to pass their own version of the law, essentially, uh, that could be less restrictive than the state law. And so each district in Louisiana, while well, most are based off of models that are posted on the State Education Agency website, most districts have their own version of the law, which, as you can imagine, makes it very difficult for districts to share best practices and for ed tech companies to deal with all of the various districts in this single state in this landscape of over 120 state student privacy laws in the United States. Some other examples of unintended consequences that we saw, um, a state out west, I think uh, possibly Montana, but I can't remember, um, set their end size pretty high. So the size at which um, you couldn't report information below that, they set it at 10, which is generally considered a best practice. As it turned out, because they have a lot of rural districts, that meant that they were unable to report 56% of high school graduation rates that particular year when they were requested. So they actually had to change that um, in their regulations. New Hampshire introduced a law that banned video recording unless you got the consent of the school board, the teacher, the parents, and the students which sounds pretty reasonable. Having a video camera randomly in the back of your classroom sounds a little creepy, but there's a lot of students who use video recording as part of their individualized education plan. So special ed students who need those video recordings in order to help them learn. We're also at a point where most teacher certification is done via video recordings that are uploaded to the teacher certification websites. And so you also had teachers who were not able to be certified by certain bodies without going through this arduous consent process. The law was partially changed the following year to allow video recordings for special ed kids. Teacher certifications are still not allowed without going through the consent process. And then, uh, I'll just address the school and district uh, unintended consequences side of the equation for Connecticut, um, because Sarah's about to talk about its implications for companies. But one of the requirements in Connecticut's law was that uh, parents had to receive a notice, a very extensive notice, um, every time the school signed a new contract. And under the Connecticut law, any vendor you worked with, even if one or two students were using a downloadable software, you had to have a contract. And parents had to receive information about the privacy protections, why you were using it, a whole bunch of information. And the way that the law was interpreted, again, this is mostly a problem of vagueness and interpretation, the way that they were reading it, schools had to proactively send these notifications to parents. Again, this was fixed the following year, but in the meantime, uh, districts had no idea how they were going to do this. They were very um, used to posting things on websites, but proactively essentially spamming parents with so much information that they didn't actually have time to read that wasn't actually useful wasn't a helpful privacy protection in this particular case. With that being said, this doesn't mean that the laws haven't done valuable things. There 
were so many open questions and so many issues. And so states like Utah, Colorado, and others passed laws which in many ways had very favorable pr provisions that districts appreciated, that provided them a privacy structure they could work in while still allowing for innovation in districts and in the classroom. But there are also laws that are passed that have unintended privacy consequences. We've seen this most obviously in the school safety setting, where you had a law, for example, passed last year in Florida that included a requirement that a database be created of social media information that would be combined with law enforcement and social services data that could be used to identify threats. There were not privacy protections built in about who could see the data. How long would it be kept? Remember, we're probably talking about the Instagram post of an 11 or 12 or 13 year old sitting in this state database. And that wasn't something that was considered by the sponsor of the bill. You also had a requirement that students disclose mental health referrals when they registered for schools in that law. The one school who tried to implement that, it didn't go very well. You had a lot of parent outcry pushing back on the idea that the school needed to keep information that in their mind wasn't essential and was something that could be used to discriminate against their child. So it's worth keeping in mind that despite some of the unintended consequences here, you have had many state laws that have been useful in putting in place privacy protections. And as we move forward with state laws, making sure that those privacy protections carry over to other laws that aren't specifically about privacy is really important. So with that being said, I'm gonna turn things over to Sarah to talk about the laws dealing with vendors. Great. And I'm going to grab my little <laughs> cheat sheet just so I don't say anything wrong. So like I said at the beginning of uh, my talk, uh, there's no strictest student privacy law. Um, FERPA is the floor. And of the state laws, you can't just look at, go to a particular state and say, oh, great, as long as I'm following that law, I'm good. That doesn't, you can't do that, unfortunately. There's, there's parts of various state laws that you could look at, look at and say, oh, that's pretty strict. Maybe that's probably the one to follow, but you can't, you can't just go to say New York or Colorado or Connecticut and think that you're good and compliant with all of the student privacy laws across the country and all of the various district policies that they set forth. So I'm going to talk about just three of the laws, um, California, Colorado, and Connecticut, um, and hopefully get, a little bit of what what various states ex, states have set up, um, set their how they have set their expectations for protecting student privacy, protecting the privacy of the students of their state. So I'll start with California's Student Online Personal Infor Information Protection Act, so PIPA. This this law has actually been, or some version of it, has been adopted across the country in a very in um, several other states. It, it has morphed and changed depending on the state. Um, but generally speaking, um, these three bullets are um, applicable in many different states. Um, so PIPA is, the is one of the first laws of its kind to apply directly to vendors that serve K-12 students. Um, the operator, so the education technology vendor that is um, to be used in the classroom uh, may not use the student information that they access to um, engage in targeted advertising. They may not use information to amass a profile about a K-12 student except for in the furtherance of a K-12 purpose. So you can amass a profile if it's to be used in the educational for an educational purpose, and you also can't sell student information. So a company just can't go out there and sell student information. Um, some of these laws do include, include provisions, actually I think all of them, uh, if there's a merger or acquisition, um, but uh, generally a company can't go out there and just sell student data to the highest bidder. That's not allowable under the law. Um, and also in SOPIPA, PIPA, 
Um, and we'll talk about this a little bit more. Amelia has talked a little bit about security procedures, um, but operators must implement and maintain reasonable security procedures, which in the FERPA 101 um, presentation, Michael talked about how reasonable security procedures change pretty rapidly, so putting it into, uh, into law might not be reflective of the current best practices. Um, so California's includes um, a more general statement with regards to security procedures. And if you want to add anything, feel free to interrupt. Um, moving on to Colorado, Colorado takes a different, different approach. It's um, one of the one of sort of the standalone ones for now with with regards to student data privacy. Uh, the there's a distinction between two different types of vendor the school service contract providers and school service on-demand providers. Um, and they both need to comply with provisions of the law, but um, there's different requirements for each different kind of provider. Um, for instance, on-demand providers, you might think of that as an app that a teacher uses in the classroom for just general, um, just like a, fun little spelling quiz or something like that, make sure that they, you review the terms of service agreement and that's um, based on how Colorado has outlined their priorities for that. Um, Mike, Michael Haw has also provided some best practices on when, for reviewing terms of service agreement. Um, Colorado also requires data destruction upon termination of a contract. Um, there's also a fun um, uh, provision of this law um, uh, a, we, I like to call it a blacklist. Um, if a on-demand provider does not meet the requirements of the law, then they could be added to a blacklist in the state um, and posted on the local education agency, uh, on the school's, school district's website, um, which is a fun little provision. I don't think anyone has been added to a blacklist no. as of right now, but Those they are could- are initiated by yeah. parent complaints, yep. generally. Yeah. And moving on to um, my last C state, Connecticut. Um, there is, Connecticut includes a number of things that are included in SOPIPA. There's also specific requirements for data breaches um, resulting in the unauthorized disclosure of student information. There are specific security measures, which is different than the California SOPIPA law, um, which has reasonable security measure, measures that are very specific of what they require. Um, in Connecticut for protecting student data. Um, and uh, another thing, there are specific requirements. Amelia talked a little bit about the unintended consequences in Connecticut, but requirements for contracts um, that vendors sign in the state. Um, many vendors are uh, required to sign, all vendors are required to sign a um, contract addendum in, if they're doing business in the state of Connecticut. And that's a pretty fairly standard agreement um, that vendors are signing and you can, you can the, the contract and addendum is available on the state of Connecticut's website for everyone to read. Um, and yeah. And, and I'll speaking just say, of yeah. contracts. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just say briefly on uh, Connecticut, um, on the data breach provision in particular, I think it's an excellent example of an unintended consequence uh, in a student privacy law. So the data breach requirements allow the company, I believe it's 60 days, somewhere around there, a good amount of time before they have to report the breach to the school district. But once the school district gets the information, the district has three days to go ahead and tell parents and students who were affected by the breach. So for me, this acts as a disincentive for companies to actually let their customers know about breaches, especially if it hasn't been fixed yet, if you don't know who's affected, uh, and it makes it really difficult for school districts to know what is happening and really puts the ed tech company in a very complicated position because as soon as they tell the school district, those three days start ticking. So it's really, again, important that these laws be specific, that they consider uh, whether a breach has been patched, whether uh, there's been enough time for people to find out who's affected, 
and that hasn't always been done in many states. So some trends to watch in state student privacy laws. Uh, first of all, contracts. Uh, so one of the top trends that we've seen is the Student Data Privacy Consortium. It was started by a district in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, and uh, really was a way for that district. Massachusetts doesn't have a student privacy law since 2013. Um, it was a way for that district to impose higher privacy standards than those that were required under FERPA. And he quickly realized that other districts would find this useful. So he started working with other districts in Massachusetts, took it to a national organization, and now the Student Data Privacy Consortium is operating in over 20 states using a fairly similar contract addendum on privacy in most of those states. And they are currently working on a national model contract addendum. So there are advantages and disadvantages to this. Advantages, of course, ideally the ed tech company and the district are just dealing with a single contractual addendum. You don't have a hundred different versions of a privacy contract floating around. But on the other hand, if you have a business where you want to limit liability, which is pretty common, or if your business doesn't fit within this particular model, it says you have personally identifiable information and you don't, or it imposes some sort of uh, breach insurance or whatever it is and that's not applicable to you, you've had a lot of companies push back and particularly for smaller districts, that don't have someone who works on student privacy who deals with these contracts on a regular basis, that's often seen as hostile. And so uh, that has been part of the process of people realizing that there's gonna be pushback on these contracts as folks move forward. Uh, Sarah, anything yeah, to add there? I, I, think, I think just with the, with the model contracts that we've seen, I think the for a best practice, we've seen when the vendors and the schools are able to engage in a dialogue, especially where the model contract or addendum doesn't align with the practices of the vendor. If they're able to engage in a dialogue and amend or adapt that particular contract to how the product works within, within, the, within the scope and within the guardrails of um, protecting student privacy, but making sure that the addendum that is signed is reflective of the actual business practices and reflective of the expectations of the district to protect student privacy. I think as long as they're moving in that way, then there is some positive movement, but I think there is some caution from the vendor side if they're just signing an agreement without reading it because that's the only way that they're going to be able to be purchased by the school district. It could open them up to some sort of liability uh, that they, either don't expect or really don't think about as they're going into the school, school district. So one of the things I really, really like about the SDPC model is that it's all public, which vendors may disagree. <laughs> but um, I really like that there's a database, you can go to this web page, you can select a particular state alliance or search the database as a whole and see which vendors have been approved, which have not, and in many cases see the contract addendum that's been signed for a particular vendor. And so you can know what your competitors have agreed to as a best privacy or security practice in a district. Uh, other districts can see which tools have been approved and not approved, and it's just been a really valuable resource because it really is impossible for people to vet apps on an ongoing basis. You just receive so many updates on your phone, on devices. Um, it, things are updating constantly in today's technological world. And so re-vetting an app every single time there's an update and making sure that the privacy policy and the actual practices are in alignment is really difficult. So many, many folks are moving over to having a contractual addendum instead. So the next trend to watch is specified security standards. So we started to touch on this. This in many ways, I, I think, started as an outlier where you actually had 
the New York State Education Department passed a law in 2014 that was 100% written as a pushback to in bloom. Like the, the preface to the student privacy law is the anti in bloom law. And uh, as part of that, New York was an outlier. It actually imposed specific security standards for encryption. They required HIPAA level encryption. However, moving forward, pretty much every other state just said reasonable security standards because as Sarah mentioned, it is a best practice to make sure that those security standards evolve as technology evolves. So there isn't a required security standard that becomes outdated. However, you had incidents like this happen. You had uh, essentially uh, trolls on the internet, uh, cyber attackers um, from the UK go after at least four small rural districts that we know of, we're pretty sure there are more, and get access to student information systems, to camera feeds, to all sorts of information, and then use that information to send ransom letters to the superintendents with death threats, with threats to disclose which students were special ed, which students had discipline records, all sorts of information that no one necessarily prior to this would have said is technically sensitive. Everyone thought that hackers would only go after information that could be used to steal identities. And so this was a big wake up call to a lot of people. You had the hackers use really common information that every school has, parents' cell phone numbers, students' cell phone numbers, to text death threats to those students. And so everyone suddenly realized that even if you're a tiny district with 50 kids, even if you don't have information that could be used to steal identities, you are the low hanging fruit. You as a small ed tech company, you as a small district could be targeted. And so more and more security has been pushed from the New York law where we now have regulations that haven't been passed but were recently put out for comment that require not only HIPAA level encryption but also the imposition of the NIST uh, framework for not only companies but also districts. And I believe it also expanded to HIPAA technical safeguards widely mm -hmm. in the regulations, but I can't That's remember for state. sure. Well, here we go. <laughs> That's a good lead in, which is we now have additional states that have adopted this. As Sarah mentioned, Connecticut requires HIPAA technical safeguards. And you also now have a law that's likely to pass in Illinois, which will also require HIPAA technical safeguards and the NIST framework as part of their law. And best practices that meet or exceed current security standards. Just in case you didn't think it was covered. Yeah. And yeah. that is for both companies and districts. And so this is going to be brand new to the vast majority of companies that are not Amazon and Google and all of those who have been already having those standards. This is going to be a really high burden, not only for small ed tech companies, but also for a lot of districts, the vast yeah. majority yeah. of whom are tiny and don't have the resources and capacity to adopt this high a level of security. Well, and, and specifically when you're telling schools to go look at the law on the Health and Human Services website and try to figure it out, it's a whole different sort of language that they're trying to navigate than that they might be familiar with. Um, and same goes for ed tech vendors. It's just a completely different legal framework um, that, that, people, that people are gonna have to figure out. We'll, we'll see what we're saying about it in a year. But. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so training. Uh, if I had talked to you two years ago, three years ago, I would have complained loudly about the lack of training. And there's still a major lack of training in most of the laws that passed. But we've started to see more and more states require training for either companies and their employees or for districts and uh, their employees or state level employees. So often, unfortunately, this is an unfunded mandate. But at the end of the day, since privacy and security rely on avoiding human error more than anything else, uh, this has been incredibly important. Enforcement. 
we have not yet seen enforcement of any of these laws. Remember, these have passed just since 2013. We've only had five years. Most of them did not go into effect until two or three years ago. The enforcement varies by state. Uh, the vast majority of them give authority to the state attorneys general in order to enforce the laws, but some have fines, some have um, the Department of Ed be able to go in, New York, <laughs> um, and uh, as I said, at least one state, Louisiana, has jail time for mistakes. Other states have jail time for malicious or uh, obvious uh, trying to disclose student data or violate privacy um, maliciously. And we're also seeing states introduce laws that include new enforcement, like misdemeanors for teachers. I don't think that law is going to pass, but um, we might see new laws introduced. Absolutely. Because we haven't seen enforcement, there has been a push for more laws and uh, more ability for people to enforce rights either through private rights of action, more possibility of misdemeanors or other things for individuals who violate the law, just trying to move enforcement forward, uh, something that's a visible sign that people are complying with the laws. And then finally, consumer privacy laws. We're about to add a whole new bunch of layers to the student privacy landscape. So I will turn it over to Sarah yeah. to <laughs> yeah. talk about these. Sure, sure. So California earlier this year made a big splash by passing a consumer privacy law, which was really the first, first in the country um, and first state in the country to pass a fairly robust consumer privacy law. Um, it was passed within a span of a couple of weeks and even the sponsors of the legislation and supporters of the legislation acknowledged that they needed to go back and fix some of the mistakes that even simple typos in the bill. Um, and they continue to work to fix it. One of the unintended consequences that we have expressed concern about and other folks in the um, other education practitioners have expressed concern about is it's unclear if the California law right now would allow a 17 year old to call up a company that has their that provides student information systems or stores grades and say, hey, company, delete my information um, as you're required to under the California Consumer Privacy Act. We don't know if the, a student would be able to do that. So we've been asking the attorney general to clarify that that is not intended. Um, California already has the SOPIPA, FERPA exists. There's other general um, privacy um, data retention requirements in the state of California that all sort of, uh, uh, that, that conflict with the California Consumer Privacy Act. Um, and we're hoping that that gets clarified. As, as other states consider legislation and as the federal government considers consumer privacy legislation, uh, we've, we've, been, um, we've been making sure people are aware that there's already privacy laws in existence protecting student privacy in the schools. Um, I think we might see some unintended consequences, but hopefully not. Um, no matter what happens, I think um, it's, it's going to be something to follow over the next several years. Absolutely, and these aren't all bad news for schools and vendors. So you do have um, a class of tool that's used in school, generally general services. Uh, so products like, not to pick on them again, but like Dragon Dictation, uh, that may be used for one or two students as part of their IEP. Right now, the school has to do their FERPA due diligence, but that company themselves don't have to comply with a particular privacy law in most states. And so this law would add an additional layer of protection. So companies like that, that fall under the various state consumer privacy laws, would now also be required to adhere to a privacy law in the same way most ed tech companies have to adhere to those student privacy laws. So stay tuned, could be good news, but there's also a lot of potential here for confusion and figuring out exactly where schools fit into this equation, especially when it comes to deleting data, as Sarah mentioned. And, and their direct control requirements under FERPA, as Michael spent a lot of time talking about. 
So, don't live in a tech bubble. So we're gonna talk about a little bit of some things that you should look out for, some things that you as an ed tech company should be aware of. So, is your product designed for privacy? What have you been thinking about? What have you been considering as you build your product, as you market your product, as you write your privacy policy? So, uh, Sarah's organization, the Software and Information Industry Association, and mine co-founded the Student Privacy Pledge uh, back in 2014, which is really a minimum standard, a straightforward, easy to read promise by 350 ed tech companies saying that they will not advertise to kids. They will not use data to create profiles for marketing purposes, that they will not sell information, that they will have reasonable security standards, all sorts of things that back in 2014 were not particularly clearly covered under FERPA. The Department of Ed actually issued guidance clarifying that in 2015. But at the time, this is really an attempt to show, no, whether the law requires it or not, ed tech companies are gonna adhere to these standards. Now that we've had 120 laws passed in states, uh, in many ways this has become a floor, but companies continue to apply for the pledge, at least one every day, and this is a good free way for someone to look at your privacy policy and say, this needs to be adjusted, this doesn't align with these minimum standards, this uh, aligns with the pledge, it's really, really helpful. And as I said, right now, it is all grant supported. Uh, you also have the pri common sense media privacy evaluations, which several districts are using, whether you like them or not. <laughs> and uh, they involve um, some really, really talented privacy people looking at the practices from the outside of companies and giving them a rating on depending on how they're able to answer those questions. Sarah, do you have something to add on that? Uh, no, I, I guess uh, it's, a, it's a good list to look at as you, from the company perspective, as you're looking to figure out if you are working within what people consider to be best practices. I, I don't think it is, it, it necessarily is exactly what every single company would need to look at, but it is, it's a good start. And it, this is absolutely a much higher standard than is required by most state laws. It has an absolute ban on certain things which are allowable based on what they decided the framework should be. And, and it's all available, public, free. I think it, it's all on GitHub and very easy to access and look at. So it's a, it's a fairly easy tool to look. Absolutely. To. Uh, and generally, there are a lot of privacy tools in place if you're new to privacy that can help you figure out whether your product is built for privacy. So the Fair Information Practice Principles, which were created way back in the 1970s, right around the time of FERPA, uh, were, which are the basis of almost every privacy law in the world. It involves things like looking at whether you're being transparent with users, with the school, with the individual students and parents. Whether you have individual participation, are people able to access their record, challenge the data, delete information that's incorrect, uh, making sure that uses are limited. You're not allowed to get data for one purpose and then use it for something else. Is it quality data? Do you check to make sure it's accurate? Uh, are you specifying what purposes you'll use the data for? Are you getting rid of data that you no longer need and only collecting the data you need to answer questions or to run your product or to personalize learning? And are you being accountable? Are you making sure that all of these things are continuously followed, even as policies and products and staff change, as well as ensuring security? And then Privacy by Design is a framework that began in the 1990s. Uh, Dr. Anne Kavukian, uh, who was the um, Privacy Commissioner of Ontario at the time, created this concept, and it really involves looking at how you're building privacy into your product. Now, at this point, many companies have moved sort of beyond privacy by design, but for a small startup, for someone just starting to really think about privacy, this is a really good thing to look at along with the FIPS. Next step, consider the creepy factor. 
this is the one that I see more issues with than everything else. So going back to the Siegel framework, we've got compliance with law, we've got things that are actually privacy and security threats, but we also have how people look at things. It doesn't matter how amazing you think your product is, it doesn't actually matter how well your product helps kids if people think it's creepy because no one's gonna use it or it's going to get banned. And so it's really important to consider what the perspectives are out there. So these are somewhat extreme views, but it's important to consider. You have um, a particular group, which is the leading parent group in the student privacy conversation, <laughs> which in their recent uh, report card for state laws, downgraded states that had personalized learning allowances. So they said that data collected through technology services are often used to create individual student profiles. Profiles developed for educational purposes may be used to make instructional decisions about a student based on her interests, abilities, and predicted performance. Profiles created for non-educational purposes are often used to market or advertise to a student or his parents. Both, both uses, according to this report, are a threat to a student's privacy. And so when we as an education community, as the ed tech community, talk about personalized learning, I think we all think that everyone has this fuzzy concept that this is good, this is, everyone agrees that this is something that should happen, but you should be aware that there are many prominent voices out there that if you're not building in privacy protections, if you're not simultaneously explaining how you're protecting privacy while personalizing learning, well, your product can be as good as it wants, but it's not gonna get over the privacy barrier. Another quote from a comment to the Commission on Evidence-Based Policymaking, this particular person objected again to the idea of personalizing learning, saying that the idea identifying a child's strengths and weaknesses and using that information to help them make decisions about their future is a good idea, but the United Nations idea, no idea how this came, of data collection and globalizing our nation's children, making them human capital is un-American and Hitler-esque. There are extreme views here. This was a very common type of comment that came to the Commission on Evidence-Based Policymaking when they were considering not education privacy specifically, but generally use of data by the federal government. So it's really important, again, as we talk about things like personalized learning or social and emotional learning, school climate, these are not universally accepted ideas. So next, plan for bad or stupid actors. As we mentioned, there are hackers that will just go after the low-hanging fruit. Another example of this is you had ISIS go after a vendor that happened to run 800 school websites. And as you can imagine, what happened was the vendor for sure lost a whole lot of customers that day, but the districts got in trouble and had local papers reporting that they had ISIS propaganda on all of their websites. And as you can imagine, those were some fun school board meetings. It's really important to consider that even if it's someone else's mistake, it's going to affect you as an ed tech company when dealing with your subcontractors or the district, and as a district dealing with your ed tech companies. Bad actors or just actors who aren't maybe thinking well uh, is important to consider. You had a story that's been told again and again of a school district employee. This was not signed off on by top level folks in this district, a school district employee who turned on students' webcams when their school issued laptops were in their bedrooms. And then a principal proceeded to punish a student for something they were doing in their bedroom. The school district was sued. <laughs> But down the line, about three years after this happened, a little over three years after this happened, a report came out of the ACLU of Massachusetts that actually criticized companies that were allowing location or webcams to be turned on, even though in those cases, the turning on of the videos was if the device was lost or stolen. So again, one stupid person. <laughs> can ruin it for everyone else, can make it so you have to take those 
people into consideration when you're designing your product, when you're deciding what settings can be turned on and off. And then this really unfortunate incident brings in ethics. And again, what are the defaults? How is your product being used? And when it's used, how is that going to reflect back on you? So Mount St. Mary's University is a college in Maryland. They hired a new president who was from the business world. He decided that the best thing he could do was improve the school's rankings. And so what he did was he gave a survey to all the incoming freshman students, didn't tell anyone how it was going to be used, and used that, went through some sort of analytics process to point out the students who would definitely fail. And then tell those students, offer those students back their tuition, and tell them to leave. Now this would have improved the rankings. Um, but in this case, you had faculty and students who found out about it. There was a whole fur, and at the end of the day, it didn't happen. But again, it's important to consider, we always go into this thinking that everyone's going to be a good actor. And most of the time, they are. But you need to make sure there are privacy and ethical controls in place as much as possible to avoid this sort of thing happening and reflecting back on you. Help your customers. I'm going to let Sarah talk for a minute, but we've had all these laws. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah. Uh, I think I think just from the vendor perspective, as working when vendors are working with school districts, it's in the vendor's interest to be helpful and accommodating and make sure that schools not only know how to use their product, but know what's in their product. So then they can in turn communicate with parents on what what's in this product that their kids are using? What's, what, what is the plan for the product? How is the information stored? I know some of the vendors that I work with actually have privacy for parents and privacy for schools directly on their websites. So that information is readily available. If a parent or a teacher has a question about any particular product, they can go to that product website and find it pretty easily. And that communication and transparency is there from the start. It's not something they aren't going to have to um, bring in a vendor to explain to an all-parent meeting at the school, which is probably the least good option there. Absolutely. So more and more school leaders are recognizing how important it is to be on top of cyber threats, particularly in the wake of the security incidents I mentioned. And training is the way to do that. Teachers need to be the first line of defense because you can pass all of the laws you want, but without implementation, that is useless. So uh, unfortunately, a lack of training has led to things like attaching the wrong attachment, which includes all of the student's information, or posting a improperly redacted uh, Excel spreadsheet that included which kids were receiving special ed services and what those services were. Or in my favorite data breach case, a teacher taking home a bunch of special ed records, put them in their recycle bin, and there was a windstorm. And the special ed records were scattered throughout the community. It is vital that every person be aware of common security and privacy protections in order to make sure that these things are minimized. And ed tech companies are in a really good place to help move that ball forward. As few resources as a small startup might have, you probably have more resources than your average school district to deal with this issue. Help educate your customers. Finally, stay informed. So I highly recommend the Department of uh, recommend the Department of Ed's website, studentprivacy.ed.gov. They have a million useful checklists, an overview, model terms of service, which is perhaps my favorite for ed tech companies, uh, as well as videos on various aspects of FERPA and other pertinent laws. Another resource, which I'll let Sarah talk about, is SIAs. Yeah, yeah, we, um, we work directly with vendors. We're a vendor. We're a trade association for technology companies, so do a lot of work with our members, um, both uh, the proactive education of what's happening generally in the um, state legislatures and uh, um, in Congress, but also just education of what it means to be a business serving education, um, serving the education space.
And then uh, our website that FPF runs, we're a nonprofit sort of think tank organization that works on consumer privacy, and we run FERPA Sherpa, uh, which is a free resource where we post uh, our own blogs, guest blogs, information for students, parents, policymakers, educators, districts, states, pretty much anyone we can think of, including ed tech vendors, as well as a library of resources that are tagged by audience and by topic. And any resource that we find even a little bit useful, we will put up on the website um, so you're able to access not only our resources, but the resources of every other organization that has worked on student privacy over the past several years. So with that, thank you all so much for listening.